This is part two of my build of the Cargo Trans C160. There'll be a link up there for the first part, which I suggest you watch. Otherwise, this isn't going to make very much sense to you. We've been following the Chinglish instructions. They've been pretty vague in parts, to put it mildly, which is one of the reasons for making these videos. However, things get worse with the radio installation. On the last page, there is no English translation at all, and even the Chinese refers to figure numbers which don't match the photographs, which is really useful. However, like Baldrick, I have a cunning plan. Using the Google Translate app, maybe not everybody knows, but you can go into the camera section and actually scan a document. If I just press scan here, Start it going, select all. Hopefully you can see there that we can now make some sense of the Chinese, which may or may not help us in our endeavors. If you're interested in learning more about how the Translate app works, I also have a video on that subject. Moving on then, the first thing that we need to do is to install the servos for the rudder stroke steerable nose wheel and the elevator. Let's now then get on with that task. Our first task then is the installation of the servos to control the rudder and the steerable nose wheel, this guy here, and the elevator. Starting first then with the elevator. This was just a servo out of my spares box that already had a suitable arm on it. I just mark the foam where it needs to be cut a little to allow this particular servo to fit in that slot there and positioned it checking that the control rod is in the most direct line as straight as possible and starting point with the servo at 90 degrees. Hooked up my little PWM detector and set it for the midpoint of 1500 microseconds and the arm at 90 degrees so all is good. You can see a good range of movement there and you can also see that I've not fixed the servos in yet once I'm completely happy with the installation I think I'll just tack these down with some hot melt glue. The elevator then I've chosen to use my own little clever sort of arrangement there. The ones supplied uh, don't work for me you have to insert this little peg into the control horn itself and that would either mean that it would need to be on this side and that would put the control rod at, a, at an angle there. I don't, don't like that idea. And if I put it in this way up, obviously I can never tighten it up because the screw would be close against the elevator there. So using one of these, buy these in bags of 10, I think, and I'll, I'll put a link down in the description to these ones. And we can see plenty of movement for the elevator control. And that's all there is to the elevator. Turning our attention now then to the rudder stroke steerable nose wheel. Clearly you need to have a suitable arm and I've elected to use a metal gear servo because no doubt knowing my landings the nose wheel is going to be under a degree of shock and although most of the shock will be absorbed by the control rod there being around 30 centimeters long I still felt that it would be a good idea to have a Metal Gear servo in there. Once again, you can see I've chosen the most direct and straight route for the control rod itself, passing through to the back here and at our midpoint, so everything's at 90 degrees. We have a goodly amount of travel for the rudder then. And also the control of the nose wheel. Still have some final adjustment to do with these and I haven't glued these servos in but in principle things are working. Now I can move on, hot glue these in place once I'm 100% happy with everything and now we can move on to the wing servos. Not much to say about the aileron servos. Now, working away there. And, uh, more than decent amount of throw and of course setting the 
centre position correctly. Now I did depart from the original fittings again, one because this would have resulted in one screw being inside and one outside, I prefer to have them on the outside, and who knows what servo the slot was cut out for. I couldn't find anything even remotely that shape, so I ended up having to cut the foam to allow this servo to, to sit in there, and even then they don't sit flush, and clearly there's not enough room there to start hacking any more foam out, so they're slightly proud of the, of the surface there. And I've used a different arrangement here, and that's all there, there is to it then. You'll need a Y cable to connect those up to your receiver. Let's move on now and take a look at the motor and nacelle assembly. The assembly of the motors and the engine nacelles I found to be probably the most challenging part of the entire build, but there is virtually nothing written either in English or Chinese to explain what on earth is going on. We're supplied with these little ply plates, which clearly you screw the motor to, but these haven't been countersunk, so the screw heads were standing proud. What I did was to take a suitably sized drill and just countersink those so that they will sit flush when it's screwed onto the part of the mounting here. Something to note here is that although there are dimples in the plastic, do not rush ahead and drill those out thinking that they line up with these, because they don't. The best idea is to offer the ply plate up, get it well lined up. There's a good notch there that lines up with the air scoop or whatever it's supposed to be on the side there, and then that will sit on there. Once you've got that and you're happy with it, you can drill a pilot hole for the screw. There are no screws supplied for this job. Fortunately, I have a whole bunch of them. Being the consummate pack rat that I am, if ever I scrap a piece of equipment, then I always rob all the screws and any hardware fittings that I think will be of use and squirrel those away. I've only made the pilot holes for two screws at the moment just to line that up. I'm somewhat dubious about how well this is going to hold, just drilling into this very thin plastic, how well that's going to hold up. I think I may even put some double-sided tape on this side to help with the fixing. I wouldn't go as far as to using epoxy or anything, as no doubt at some point we will need to get it off. Motor wires going down through there then, and they pop out through this hole here. By the way, I've obviously started to spray paint these. They were a lovely shade of grey. How many shades of grey are there? About 50, I guess. Anyway, so I started to spray these up, but before I do the final coat, I just wanted to fix them, as I have with this one, onto the front. I will probably dab a blob of Vaseline on the heads of these screws when I spray it. That way I can clean them off easily. You have to cut the excess material off here and it says to take it down to six millimeters. I thought that wasn't really enough. Distance here is eight. I've elected then to go with eight on this side as well and that will fit on there like that. I have also of course drilled out the holes here. That one I think is eight millimeters. This one is a little over ten. That being the size of the boss here on the propeller. When the propeller sits on there tighten it down. That's the, about the amount of gap that we're going to get there. So that should look quite nice. The last job then is securing with the small screws this front part of the nacelle. Strangely the screws have been provided for this. They are very tiny indeed. You're going to need a pilot drill of just under a millimeter and I elected to put them here and just down the bottom there as I showed you on the other unit. So one in the top and one on either side. Clearly we're going to need to extend the motor wires out through the hole here before we assemble the whole thing. I've bought a box of silicon wire. You can get this in many places. I'm just going to choose three colors at random and make up the extension needs to go to the speed controllers. That's after I finished painting. I'm going to go off and do that right now. Perhaps the first question is, where on earth do the nacelles actually fit? There's no guidance or measurement given in the instructions. 
where it appears to be is just where the wing starts to kink, if you will, towards the ailerons. And that's some 165 millimeters from the center point. That's where we're going to go for. The ESCs that I'm going to use are, are these, and I've used these quite a lot and found them very reliable. There'll be links down in the description to these guys. I don't like having too many joins in the cables. The supplied cable is only yay long. What I've elected to do then is to desolder those cables and I shall make up some extension leads to go from the motor. The two ESCs will fit either side there. This is the edge of the fuselage here that it sits inside, so they need to go side by side around there. And then the extension wires obviously pass through the hole in the end of the nacelle and up to about here. I make that length 240 millimeters, 24 centimeters. I'm going to go ahead now and cut the wire and then I'll show you my method for joining it all together. The way I like to do this is to stagger the cuts of the three wires. That way when I put the insulation over there's no way that they can touch and it makes for a lower profile if you like join. I've already tinned the ends of the motor wires. I'm just going to tin each of the connections here and this is a really handy device I made this myself I'll put a link up there so that you can see that project if you like I think I've inhaled sufficient lead over the last 50 years and then just butt join each of the connections here what I'm also going to do is to use some of this Plasti Dip or liquid insulation, if you will. Not strictly necessary, as I say, the, the joints are sufficiently far apart, but as they tell you, in the unlikely event of a landing on water. Here then is the finished result. That's quite neat. All we need to do is to slide the insulation over everything. And the job's a good one. Let's reassemble that onto the nacelle. Then we can get on to epoxying these in place. Not forgetting to rough up the surface here and on the wing to remove that shiny covering. This stuff then is a very useful addition to the workshop. Uh, you can find many uses for it. Not only just insulation, but weatherproofing equipment, general sort of sealing work, and even... When you're painting, you can put it on as a as a mask. Being of rubbery consistency, you can just peel that off once you've finished painting. With the nacelles epoxied into place then, I've just temporarily tacked the wires onto the speed controller there so that I can check the direction of rotation of the motor. The speed controller is just taped to the wing there with some thick double-sided foam. To check the direction, all I've done is to put a piece of tape on there. I'm not going to put the propellers on, that would be dangerous. I've decided to make the installation with counter-rotating propellers. Some people say that it doesn't make any difference and you can have both motors spinning the same way. As it's not difficult to do with the ESC wiring, I will have them counter-rotating. Note that that's counter-rotating and not contra-rotating, which some people say, which it is not contra-rotating being two propellers on the same shaft spinning in opposite directions. Having decided then to go counter-rotating, the next debate is should the propellers spin inboard or outboard at the top of their stroke? Conventional wisdom appears to be as the propeller arcs through the top of its stroke it will be rotating inboard towards the fuselage. Let's see what we have then. I don't know if you can see there. No danger of doing that, but this is in fact spinning outwards at the top of its stroke. I will therefore reverse two of the ESC wires to make it spin in the opposite direction. Then I'll do the same for the other side. Gone ahead and fitted the correct handed propellers on either side now. That's all looking good. 
A couple of final notes on the installation and connection of the speed controllers. Clearly need to parallel those together for the power there. And I've just soldered a XT60 on there. With regard to powering the receiver, each one of these contains the, the BEC circuit, the 5 volt circuit for the receiver. However, you only want one actually powering the receiver. Putting both of those with power on is possibly going to cause a problem. Therefore, on this lead, all I've done is to take the 5 volt power connection out and taped it back on the lead there. Uh, that way in the, in the future if I need to use the BEC on this I can simply push the connection back in. And I've left the two connections because I like making life difficult for myself. Therefore I'm going to use two channels on the receiver for the motors and set up a differential thrust arrangement. More on that later. And there clearly is the connection parallel together for the ailerons. Moving on then to the next mystery, which is the battery installation. Now I've seen people cutting hatches open in here to, to put batteries in and things. But in the instructions it clearly shows the battery installed underneath ab above the wheels. Uh, it doesn't give you very much leeway on the centre of gravity but I've checked things out and it seems to work well for me. Using the suggested components, the balance from the motors and the nacelles on the wing uh, seems to be correct for this arrangement. One departure I am going to make is that they recommend here a two-cell pack, of which I don't have any, in which case I'm going to put a three-cell pack in there, and I've tested that, and it fits in OK and can still get the wheels in. You can see the same area here and this is a 3 cell 1500 pack that fits comfortably in there and is flush. What I have done is to open out the hole here rather than pass the battery connections as they did through where the servos are mounted. I don't want them to interfere with the servo arrangement. I've just opened out that hole here and that's where the connection's going to come through. You saw the XT60 connector that I put on the ends of the motor wires. By the way, to open out that hole I used this Weller soldering gun and as far as I'm concerned the only good thing that's useful is for cutting foam. <laughs> I would never attempt to solder anything with it. That's my personal view. The next thing to do then will be to think about where and how to install the receiver. I'm going to be using this six channel receiver, the name of which we cannot mention. And it's going to be located somewhere in this area here. I have thoughts for sticking it on the, on the bulkhead there. I think what I'll do first is just to hook it up and make sure that all the servos are functioning from my transmitter. In the last section of this video then I've temporarily lashed up the receiver and just wanted to show you the control surfaces and possibly more interestingly the differential thrust arrangement on my transmitter. Welcome to OpenTX. Firstly then the conventional control surfaces elevator then down is up and vice versa rudder to the right to the left and the nose wheel you can't see but it is turning in the opposite direction and finally the ailerons we go to the right that right one goes up and vice versa throttle test throttle active we can see them both spinning away there in terms of differential thrust then, what I've done is to set up a switch here. With the switch down, it, it doesn't do anything. In the middle position, it's a taxi mode. Taxi mode. In the taxi mode, I've linked at the moment only 10% of mix between the rudder and the motors. If I put the rudder then to the right, we increase the throttle a little. You can see the model moving away there. In addition to the taxi type function then, I've also 
for in flight I think it would be interesting to see what happens if we mixed the aileron also with the differential thrust. Diff thrust aileron. So no surprise if I go to the right we've got the left hand motor spinning up and vice versa. As I say it's only a 10% mix uh, if I get extremely clever I might put the weight of the mix on one of these uh, variable controls so that I can adjust that in flight and see what sort of effect that has. With all of that said then, I'm very happy with the way the model looks at the moment. Uh, what it will look like after the first flight uh, remains to be seen. Hopefully in the next few days, with the weather permitting, we'll get it up in the air and see how she performs. Thanks for watching.